I think everybody has Michael Jordan level talent at something. And I think that the problem is there's no momentum. It's not that you lack the talent. There's no momentum because you're just not taking action. And you're not taking action because you're overthinking it, which goes back to the 20 seconds of courage and just doing something messy. I'm Amy Jo Martin. Welcome to the Why Not Now show. You know that thing you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, that one. Why not now? Have you ever actually taken the time to ask yourself, what's stopping me? Let's talk it through. This is your chance to give that idea the attention it deserves and take action. Each episode, I have a chat with a fascinating person from entrepreneurs to athletes, celebrities, my parents, rocket scientists, and all walks of life. We talk through a critical time when they've asked themselves, why not now? We dissect that day or even that moment, step by step. My friend Kathy Heller is on the podcast today and we change it up. This is a different type of interview. We're friends and we just have an honest conversation with some twists and turns and uh, got playful. Let's just say that. I wanted to do something different, so you will see what happens. Kathy is the host of the Don't Keep Your Day Job podcast and the author of the Don't Keep Your Day Job book. She's also a songwriter, a musician, a multi-passionate gal, and her energy is infectious. You will feel it. It is tangible. And we really don't have any limits of what we discuss in this conversation. Kathy is in the business of helping people quit their jobs and find more purpose. So we talk through what that means and the things that she's learned along her journey about the process. We also talk about the messy middle, the time of transition, the times where she has been pivoting and in a transitional point and how it does get messy. I think that's often more inspiring and relatable to hear about other than the fancy things and the fancy times. So we make sure to cover off on that. We talk through marriage and just touch on a lot of things. There really were no boundaries in this conversation. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Also, heads up on the Renegade Brand Boot Camp. You've heard me talk about this for a little while now. And we are approaching the early decision deadline this week, February 28th is the deadline. So if you have been thinking about it and you haven't done anything, now is the time. Head to renegadebrandbootcamp.com. A lot of people ask me, they say, do you think I'm ready? I'm not sure if I'm ready. And my answer is ready is a mindset. It is not a number of years on a resume. It is not a level of revenue or a date on the calendar. It is completely a mindset. And in my experience, if you've been thinking about it, or even just checking it out, it's very likely you're ready. So you can take that as a sign. Renegadebrandbootcamp.com is the website. And February 28th is the deadline for the early decision pricing. Are you ready for change? Or maybe you're already in a season of expansion. As we embrace this new decade, are you ready to take action on your own Why Not Now idea? Maybe that means starting the company, launching the podcast, writing the book, or doing more public speaking, injecting your why into what you are doing. At the end of the day, that is exactly what creates connection. And connections convert. My life work is to help guide women through this very stage in their life. I do this through the Renegade Brand Bootcamp. It truly is the career love of my life. The reason I love this program so much is because I'm able to create a mosaic, a collection of like-minded, like-hearted, driven women who come together to level up. They learn the renegade mentality directly from me, and I share everything I've learned over the past 20 years in business. 
It's equal parts education, collaboration, accountability, and community. We are accepting applications for our 2020 program. And you are welcome to go check everything out about the program at renegadebrandbootcamp.com. And as a very first step, just sign up for my five-day email series. I uncover all of the questions about the bootcamp and help you understand if it's right for you. We've had some incredible women come through the program, and you will hear from them as well. You can check out the curriculum, the structure, the vibe, and everything in between. Many years ago, I went to Mark Cuban and asked him for investment advice. I thought I was going to get some real estate or stock market type of advice. Instead, he said, invest in yourself. Invest in your own growth. Invest in yourself. Bet on yourself. This is the best ROI you will ever find. If you're at that point where you are ready to take action, head to renegadebrandbootcamp.com. We tackle the most taboo topics on the Why Not Now show. Oftentimes, you're hearing guests share things they've never shared before. In the spirit of things we don't typically talk about, you should know that the Why Not Now show is supported by Poopery, the original before-you-go toilet spray. It's magic. My friends at Poopery have literally taken the smell out of you-know-what. This pure blend of essential oils stops bathroom odor before it begins. Visit Poopery.com and Why Not Now listeners get 20% off with code Why Not Now. That's all one word. And you can hear the story about Poopery in our interview with founder Susie Batiste. That's Why Not Now, episode 28. Poopery is also available at Target. Kathy, welcome back to the show. I'm so excited to chat with you and dive in. There are so many things. I I just can't even take it because all your listeners know it, but I just, I don't know how many times in the last year I've just sent you a text going, I can't even deal with how amazing you are, how brave you are, how beautiful, how real, how inspirational. I just don't have, I don't have the words for it. And I'm usually not at a lack for words, but it's just always a treat to be around you because you're such a shining star. Oh my goodness. Likewise, likewise. We, gosh, it's been two years since we've had you on the podcast and uh, yeah, can you believe that? And everything that's happened with both of us life-wise, it's, we've just got a lot of catching up to do. That being said, this is going to be a different interview. So just get ready, sister, because (laughs) we're not doing the same old, same old. I've got these vulnerability is sexy cards in front of me that my mentor Susie Batiste sent me. So we're going to get those out too, just so everybody it. can expect a curveball. Yeah. And it's who knows what's going to go down. But let's start where we always do. Yep. I need a why not now story. I know you have a million. Can you tell me about a time when you had a big decision to make and you asked yourself, why not now? You know what? This is an interesting thing you just asked me because I was just talking to Bob Goff. Do you know Bob? Yeah. Well, I don't yeah. know him actually personally, but I know of him. And he was saying to me, there's a line in that movie, We Bought a Zoo. You know that movie with Scarlett Johansson and Matt Damon? No. And anyway, it's a <laughs> beautiful, beautiful movie. A lot, a lot of courage comes out of that movie. But mm. there's one line in the movie we were talking about. And he said, "All he said, Kathy, you know, what, you know what it takes? 20 seconds of pure courage. Mm-hmm. That's it. 20 seconds of courage to say, why not me? 20 seconds of courage to send the text. 20 seconds of courage to post the, the first podcast that's messy. 20 seconds of courage, fill in the blank. And I feel like we're all constantly with dealing with this like upper limit. And we're always in a moment where we have a new why not now, right? Why not me? Why not now? And so for me, it was actually recent since I last talked to you. You know, I've done I've done my podcast for three years and I'm just giving and giving and giving. And, and my relationship to feeling worthy is really interesting. And I think I have a lot of stuff to continue to shed growing up with with some interesting things. And I was looking at all these people like Marie Forleo and she has B school and all these different Seth Godin, who's my mentor, he has like three programs, all MBA and all these things. And I was like, why would I do this? Who am I to do this now? I'm not ready yet or whatever. And I finally was like, I'm doing it. And in the last couple months, I just put my stake in the ground and said, 
no, I'm not the Messiah. No, I'm not the one and only human avail- like that's, that's able to teach this or help you or coach you, but I'm available and I want to make it better. And I allowed my audience to work with me in, in a big way and didn't apologize for it. And it's been life changing and it's helped me grow as a leader. And it's just been an amazing thing. You know, we, we did two seven figure launches back to back and it's only February. It's just amazing how much was on the other side of me saying, why not now? What do you think was holding you back from pressing go? Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to be a fraud. I'm going to be an imposter. Oh, I'm not, who am I to charge them? They'll be mad at me. It's like charge mm-hmm. them. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, when we had Ramit Saiti on my podcast, he wrote a book called I'll Teach You to Be Rich. And I'm sure you guys are friends. He said, Kathy, when I was growing up, cause he comes from immigrant roots and it was really hard for them to get by with a lot. And so money was really, it was scarce. And he said, there was a time in college where I paid for a trainer And my friend said, why would you spend thousands of dollars on a trainer over the course of a year? You could have just watched videos on YouTube. And he said, oh, because I I want the result. So I can either save money if that's the priority and not get the result or Mm -hmm. spend the money to get the thing I need. So I want the thing I need. I think that a lot of times we completely undervalue ourselves, and we don't want to charge because net worth has so much to do with self-worth. And so I was dealing with a lot of that stuff. And when I decided to stop apologizing and say, here's what I can offer you, here's the value I can offer, forget what it chart, what's it, what's it cost. I'm not selling you a price. I'm selling you the value that I want to give you. And when Daniel Pink was on my show, he said, if you have something that can make a, a difference in the world, whether it's a beautiful painting or a piece of software or food, he said, you have a moral obligation to put it out in the world. I'm sorry, you, you're not allowed to keep that to yourself. And so I finally took in all of these beautiful words and I did it and it was scary. And I thought maybe people would leave because I was always taught that love was something I had to constantly earn. And that if I wasn't giving 300% more than the other person that they wouldn't stick around. And Mm. that comes from my childhood. Mm. And so when I finally asked for an exchange of energy, not only were people so happy to do it, but they did it way beyond what I ever thought that they would. Amazing. This is such a such an interesting dynamic how I think historically we've tried to to bucket and compartmentalize these inside things and outside things and our, you know, beliefs and stories around money and love and then business and career and passion and purpose. And and they're all mixed in together in this nice little cauldron. Um, Oh, yeah. Nice little cauldron. Yeah. It's like we can just stir them up and and it is, they're all so connected. And I think what you said about, you know, launching this, you're offering new value and you're offering your zone of genius to use a gay Hendrix line and upper limit problems, which I know that's, oh, yeah. that's Love him. <laughs> definitely a thing for all of us. But I, when you decided to do this and you kind of looked around and it sounds like, and we've, you know, Marie Forleo has been on this show. We we all know those names, and and it's so easy for us to look out and be like, well, I can't because look at – it just – you start that comparison game. It made me think about a recent situation where a woman said to me, oh, I saw so-and-so is going to be on your podcast. It's a past guest not too long ago. But doesn't she kind of do what you do? Aren't you scared that that's, you know, that's – that's a competitor. And I hadn't even thought of that. Of course. And what's funny is that I just know, and it it took me a while because I did used to think of that. I think it's a completely different operating system where when we start to shift and it's like, no, if you are unapologetically true to yourself, your tribe will find you. And that doesn't Mm -hmm. mean someone else's tribe is smaller and taking away. It's just it's resonance and it's it's finding who you resonate yes, with. It's and, resonance. Yep. And so your your superpower is you and your and it sounds so cheesy, but gosh, you're of service. This isn't about, hey, look at me. It's about, no, I need to be giving back and sharing what I am right. uniquely qualified to share. And so good for you for owning it because the impact 
you're making, not only mm-hmm. with your podcast, but also your book, which is incredible. And congratulations on your success with Don't Keep Thank Your you. Day Job Book. Oh, my God. How to Turn Your Passion into Your Career. I mean, if there isn't anything more important, I think right now where people need to be living in their whatever you want to call it, what they're uniquely qualified to do, they're where their purpose, passion, and skill collide. So I'm just, thank you for starting off that way because so many of us, once we change that lens and we go from the, oh, there is space. Not only is there space, there's requirement. It's needed, right? Oh yeah. I mean, this is the thing is like there's 7 billion plus people in the world and we live in a time where there is so much loneliness and there's like an empathy deficit it's not important if there's already Beyonce or there's already Rachel Hollis or Amy Jo Martin, because guess what? There's 16 people that you could have a impact with today and people forget that. It's not like we only need one person to do the work. We need lots of people to do Mm. the work and we need to, like you said, you'll find your tribe. We need to be in tribes. Like, if, you, if somebody already has 7 million followers on Instagram, they can support you in a very different way than somebody who has a renegade boot camp that's got a much smaller group in it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, obviously, right? So we need to find our little corners of the world and to shine a light. And I think that people get so overwhelmed with like, well, I'm not this person. I'm not that person. It's like, right, well, you're you. Just like when you got off the bus the first day at summer camp and you found your people, and you can look mm-hmm. at it and stand back and go, but if you really look at all these kids on, on at camp, let's say there's 500 kids at camp, they're all kind of the same kid, right? The population mm-hmm. is similar, let's say. They're all around the same age. They're all from similar neighborhoods, but yet, no, 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 no. Those three girls, those were your girls. And too bad one of them was in the other bunk, But and you know what I mean. And then there's a bunch of other girls you're like, nah, right? So within what we think is everyone, no, there's really like everyone. And then there's six people in the world who really get you. And (laughs) because you resonate with those people. And because there's, like you said, your superpower is you. And there's like six things about you that are more nuanced and they have those same nuances. And that's why you can speak their language and they can learn it from you rather than somebody else, no matter how much more quote unquote famous that other person is, because you're, you can only help someone out of a well, if you've been there, I can only get you home if I know your address. So not everybody has the same stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain people who their background is dealing with divorce or there's certain people who their parents got divorced or they went through some other kind of trauma or they were a military kid or they have red hair or they fill in the blank. And therefore other people who've been through similar things go, Oh, well you get me. So I feel like you would understand better how to help me get to the next place. Exactly. And that's just, yeah. You know, the same, the riches are in the niches. It's also energetically richness in terms of experience and just emotional connection and equal value exchange, whether that's one-to-one, one-to-many, but that yeah. that intimacy, do not overlook the one-on-one. If, if you can make an impact in one person's day today, yeah. that's a rich experience. And yep. isn't that what we're all about anyway, this having joyful, rich experiences throughout every day? And so yeah. why not? It's – um. I, I keep remembering this, but I have a friend who his grandmother's 99, and she he said that she just, you know, rocks in her chair, her rocking chair every day. And she talks about her family and these rich experiences in her life, mm-hmm. joyful people. It's always about these certain people and connections she's had. She's never talking about her career. She's never talking yep. about money or her job, you know. Yeah. And so it's just – I don't know. We got to get back to the basics sometimes. But okay, quick time out here. So we're going to dip into the vulnerability card. So I've got two things. Table topics. Have you ever heard of that? Table topics? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've got two. I'm just going to kind of close my eyes. All right. What's the weirdest thing you've searched for on the internet, Kathy? Oh, my God. Hmm. <laughs> we could just do it rapid fire. <laughs> I'm just trying to think. What is the weirdest thing? Like all that came to my mind was like a a, an aviator nation jacket that's not weird Ooh, i'm like what is like i was just searching for a particular aviator nation jacket because i have a few of them and i wanted to get one for someone i don't know i don't i'm trying to i'm so boring i have three kids and i buy everything on amazon the barbie dream house all the same things for my girls i'm trying to think what would be random we can bookmark it too all because right this will flow in the back of your mind random. Okay, that's okay. okay that's okay let's do one more and then we're gonna carry on <laughs> Under what circumstances are you inclined to lie? Oh, these are these are interesting. They make oh. me uncomfortable. 
<laughs> I mean, one thing that comes to mind is if I'm like talking about how great someone is, I like make them sound like they're the king of Spain. Um, my husband's always like, oh my God, they're going to think that this person, I'm like, but they are, aren't they? Come on, this, this, this. And he always goes, you say, who does that? Who does that? And so then people think I build them up too much. Oh, um, interesting. Well, it's good to be self-aware, but also I don't think that that's the, the most terrible vice that you have. I'm trying to think what else would, well, it does say, it's interesting. It says in the Talmud that there's one time you're permitted to lie and it's giving a eulogy because people actually are never told how great they are. And really, no matter what you said, even if you thought you were saying that someone was, you know, better and better than that you think they were, they really were better and no one really saw it. Isn't that oh, sweet? Anyway. That's so true. I know. Gosh. <laughs> you know what just popped into mind is um, <laughs> if you think about a funeral, that's kind of – this This is a really odd conversation, but I, I'm prepared to go there if you are with me. So I was talking to this guy once, and he was trying to understand this concept of personal branding, and, and I said, well, we need to do an audit. And he said um, – and he's a public figure, and he, and he was listening. He's like, so basically whoever shows up to my funeral, that's a personal brand audit, right? And I was like, holy buckets. Whoa. Kind of. In a way, like when you really – it has nothing to do with fame or what people want you to be. It's It has everything to do with what they really believe you are and your relationship with them. So it's 100%. like how they make you feel, right? People who show yeah. up. I mean, every – yes, every action we take, it leaves an imprint. That's the thing. And that's the thing that I always wind up really feeling truly is that – We've all heard that saying, it's never the goal, it's who you get to become chasing your goals. But no, for reals, it's who you get to become because mm -hmm. you get to be the greater version of yourself. You get to learn that you have a greater capacity to give more of yourself. You get to learn that you thought you weren't qualified and you really could serve. You get to learn that you can allow more people to love you back. You get to learn all of those things and those are the things that are your legacy. It's the courage it's the enthusiasm. It's that optimism. It's that I'm going to do it anyway. And those things do become a lasting legacy. Yes, absolutely. It's amazing, too, how much of that goes on our digital footprint one way or another. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's switch gears. So you basically are in the business of trying to help people quit their jobs, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> like that's, you know, who would have thought, first of all, as, as yep. we were growing up that we'd be doing these things? Right? Like I yep. always think about trying to explain this to my great, great grandmother who's no longer with us, but it's like yep. just trying to explain some of this stuff would be bizarre. But let's talk about it. So a lot of people who listen to this podcast, they're in this point of transition, this point of inflection, like, I'm going to make a change. Usually have been thinking about it for quite a while. And let's talk about the messy little, messy middle a little bit where, you know, you've got one foot on one side, one foot in the other camp. Maybe it's a corporate job and a side hustle. Maybe it's Maybe it's from one business to another in terms of really mm -hmm. pivoting your business model or something. That messy middle is something we don't talk about a lot. But have you – do you have any ex examples of when you've been in the messy middle? And Oh, my God. This is everything. And everything. Yeah. Everything's usually paralleled, right? We don't just wake up one day and one turns off, one turns on. Usually we're double timing <laughs> or moonlighting. Yep. It used to be called a hobby when you have a side hustle, and now it's yep. – everybody's – generate revenue from their hobbies. So yeah, do you have an example of that? Because it's just so much more inspiring to hear about messy stuff than it is fancy stuff. Oh, heck yeah. A hundred percent. In fact, first I want to start with when people are like trying to go ahead and, and do something, right? Not only do they feel like it might not be good enough or they're messy, but part of the problem is a lot of times I find people say, I don't know what I want to do. I just know I don't like what I'm doing now. And I thought, oh, everybody knows what they want to do. They just need help building it. But a lot of people kept saying to me from the podcast, no, I just don't know. And what I learned is that I don't know is a limiting belief. I learned that a lot of times people do know, but they don't want to trust what they know because it means that they might be in pain because they might do the thing and they might not be good enough at it or so they think. It means that they might make something mediocre that's messy, just like you're saying. And so when they say, I don't know, it means I don't want to make something messy. It means everyone who's listening right now, I guarantee you by the age of seven or eight, you went through it. 
And that pain is real and it's really, really painful. And so what we've done is since by the age of eight or nine, we got our hearts broken because somebody died or somebody left or someone rejected you or you watched somebody hurt someone else or whatever it was that I wish I could take away. You built a survival skill, which is I won't be messy because if I won't be messy, I won't get rejected because if I won't be messy, my dreams won't be vulnerable to being hurt. And that is both a thing that we have to have compassion for because it helped you survive. But at the same time, now it's hurting you because it's all messy. Because when Julia Cameron was on my show, I said to her, do you think everybody's creative? And she wrote a book called The Artist's Way, by the way, for her mm -hmm. ex-husband, Martin Scorsese. He was going to give up on being a filmmaker. And she wrote this book for him. And the point is, she said, have you ever gone into a preschool classroom and seen a kid who's not creative? And I said, no. And she said, and that's because they're all willing to be messy. They've got messy sleeves, messy hair. They've got paint on their nose and it's okay. And the thing is, when we allow ourselves to be messy, the brilliant stuff slips through. It can't help it. And so every single thing I ever have done has been messy. The first time I recorded the podcast, I re-recorded it eight times. I hated it. I actually told Emma, my producer, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm sorry. And for two days, I thought I was never going to do it again. And then I decided to just do it. And I was scared and I hated it. But the good news is the, the universe doesn't care if you're ready. They just care that you're brave. And then God and, conspires um, with you. Can I intercept here for a minute? 15 million yeah. downloads later, sister. Thank goodness you pushed through the messiness, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean it is true. It's yeah. only been three, three years and I, I can't believe what's happened, but everything was messy. You know, the first time I wrote music, I used to write music full time for 10 years for film and TV and ads and trailers. And I wrote the theme song to Llama Llama on Netflix and McDonald's ads what? and Walmart. Whoa, and whoa, 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 whoa. We got a time out here. You wrote the theme song for Llama Llama? That's me singing that. What? It's a Llama Llama day. Time to learn and time oh. to play. <laughs> Lama Gilroy Nelly knew <laughs> what will best friends find to do. Don't oh you worry, you don't you fuss. Do you know it? Okay, well, I'm a little embarrassed. First of all, that's amazing. Second of all, I thought you were talking about Lama Lama Red Pajama. And you know how Ludacris redid it? I just did uh -huh. a, a music dance video in our house for this and put oh, it on Instagram. My God. So I thought you, but A, let's do more little. Breakouts in song throughout this. Okay, interview. good, good, good. I'll keep I'll keep that note to myself. I'll definitely do more. So that's a net, it's a Netflix show, Llama Llama, which is even more impressive Link probably is too than little, Llama Llama. But when Llama, he's a little pajama. older, he'll he'll probably like the show because it's basically the Llama Llama show. And, oh, um, of course, it's going to be his first word. By the way, is Llama. Pretty sure. Gen Jennifer Garner is the Mama Llama. And she's really cute. Anyway, so when I first wrote <laughs> every song I've ever written, I wanted to say no. It was messy. I remember driving to my co-write sessions or driving to the studio to record a song I wrote. And I just wanted to turn around because I hated the song. And I thought they were all awful. And some of them were really mediocre. But I'm so glad I wrote 20 mediocre songs because the 21st one got better. And eventually, it's like turning on a faucet of brown sludgy water. And it just starts running clearer and clearer. And you push through the brown sludgy water. You have to give yourself the grace to do it messy. And recently I was doing a presentation to the people who are in my coaching program, which right now is closed for enrollment, but it will be closed. open again. Yes, right it'll now. It'll open again it'll, when? In August? It'll open said? again. Sorry, okay. not August. It'll open again in end of April, May. All right. But the point is I was doing a presentation for them and I was looking up the first of things so they could see how things started messy. And I, I found a video from 1969 of Jim Henson with a green sock and it was Kermit. I worked with the Henson Company for a little while and wrote a bunch of music for them. And I got to know Lisa Henson really well. And she and I made a pilot together called The Peaceful Place. And it was such a dream to shoot that with her and make that with her. She's Jim Henson's oldest daughter and she's president. She runs Henson. And we eventually got told no from every network. And it was messy and mm -hmm. it didn't work. And I could have looked at that like a huge failure. But instead, I just saw it as it was feedback. It was feedback that the work I was supposed to do, it wasn't really being Mr. Rogers was not going to be it. And it led me to keep trying different doors. And eventually I showed up for adults doing a podcast, which I never knew. It was like a, it was just a constant like game of hot and cold, like colder, hotter. And along the way I learned so much. So there's been so much messy and one other thing that was just so cool is that I, um, Seth Godin, I mentioned him before. He's like my go-to mentor. 
and I just texted him this because I couldn't believe it. But as I was prepping for this, you won't believe it. I was prepping for this presentation to show people how things begin messy and then they wind up being extraordinary. And I, I said, I'm going to go look at Seth's first blog post, which was in January of 2002. And the first blog post is literally titled Boring. And it's like this short little post about being, he was in the Nyack airport for a few hours and he was bored. Then I said, I'm just going to go look and see what his most recent post was like just to see the difference. And the most recent post, February of 2020, was called Toward Perfect. <laughs> and it says, draw a perfect circle. Use a compass or a plotter. Now zoom in. If you zoom in close enough, you'll discover that it's not a perfect circle at all. In fact, anything we create at close enough magnification isn't perfect. It's foolish to wait until you've made something that's perfect because you never will. The alternative is to continue to move toward your imaginary ideal shipping as you iterate, getting better is the path to better. Mm. Isn't that like so meta that I was looking for that and then I was reading it and I'm like, he just taught my class. Like he just gave me, he handed it to me in those two blog posts. It was insane. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Hi everyone. If you are digging this podcast, please do us a favor and subscribe rate and review on iTunes. It just takes a moment and it means a ton to us. Also, after recording more than 100 episodes, I've created a bit of a cheat sheet on the top five things I've learned from renegades and how they get from idea to action, from dreaming to doing. I will email you the downloadable PDF when you subscribe to my newsletter. Just head to amyjoemartin.com and click on connect with me. It's funny how, too, like you had to stay open minded through, let's say, the working with Lisa Henson to realize, okay, that's that's not for me. Usually it, it, these they're the tiny shifts that create the biggest difference I've found. And we don't have to reinvent that wheel or do a huge pendulum swing. It's it's a few degrees like with, you know, with me kind of shifting and working more with female entrepreneurs. Well, it used to be celebrities or big brands I thought, oh, I'm going to have to completely redo this, all of this. It's, I'm going to do something so different, maybe go into politics. <laughs> it's like, no, yeah. I can still yep. stay in my lane but make like a, an inch more to the right or an inch yep. to the left. And then all of a sudden you realize this is my groove. That just wasn't yeah. maybe as – or it wasn't then, but it is now. Quick time out. Thank you for talking about the messy middle. When have you felt the most alone? I felt the most alone in my marriage, not every day. Sometimes I feel the most connected in my marriage, but because we have one attachment figure, once we get married, your attachment figure is your husband or your wife, whatever it is, that either makes me feel the most seen or the most alone. And when, uh, I'm, when I feel angry with him or when I feel like he doesn't get me, I am so unraveled more than I am in everything else. Because of the expectation there? Because he's your person? He because he's the only person who could hurt me that way because the only he's the mm. only person I'm that attached to. He's the only person I need that much or let in that much. And then when he doesn't see me, I feel so bad. And everybody has their own personal inner demons and mine have everything to do around around marriage because my parents had such a nasty marriage and eventually got divorced and my dad's been married three times and my mom's still alone and suffers from depression. And so it's just... I think we look for the evidence for what we believe is true. And so probably my core belief that I'm trying to always change is he's not going to see me. It's not going to work. So then I'll look for the evidence of that. And I'll be like, see, this is evidence that I'm alone and it's not going to work. And he doesn't see me. Interesting. There's so much pressure that goes into a relationship that we put on each other. Not in yeah. a, I mean, and it's not right or wrong. It just, it ends up being that way sometimes. And it's, um. It's really interesting. And and we were talking a little bit before we hopped on about having kids and what that does when, you know, your relationship is in a place, you add another dimension and maybe another, oh another <laughs> and how that starts to evolve what marriage even means and what it looks like. It's like your model changes, you know. Your model uh, totally changes. And not only that, I think a lot of women today are breadwinners. And it's very different than it was in Leave it to Beaver. And even if the woman is not the breadwinner, a lot of times women are not only at home, they're at home and they're working. 
And I think that there needs to be a lot of conversation around how to be respectful and, and just balance it all. I think that we're changing the reality. Like I have three daughters, so I think it's going to be very different for them than it was for my mom and what she was told she was expected to do. When I was growing up, my dad didn't change a diaper. He didn't do anything in the house. He wasn't expected to. And now my husband does a lot, but it's even more different because when you're the breadwinner, I think that that puts extra change on the dance. Mm -hmm. And I am the person. Mm -hmm. I am, I am the mom and I am the one that the kids definitely ask for. And at the same time, I'm the one responsible for the vision we're creating, the mortgage, all the things and my careers, you know, very demanding and exciting. But I think that that's also really interesting. And I don't know that we all have the tools yet because it's new. It's Mm -hmm. very recent, actually. Mm -hmm. 100%. It is so new. And it's Anytime we innovate, adversity is going to follow. It's going to get messy and uncomfortable, but it's important to share and talk about this. And so I'm glad that you actually mentioned this because that is how we learn. That's how we can, you know, leapfrog each other's lessons and kind of accelerate this process of what it looks like in the future. So it's it's good to be surfacing these discussions. Yeah, I agree. And yeah. You know, something keeps popping in, and I don't I think it's because these cards in front of me are called vulnerability cards. But um that word, let's talk about this word vulnerability for a second. So I heard a term the other day, someone referred to vulnerability porn. <laughs> and I was like, Well, and <laughs> what they were referring to was just you know, we, we do live in a time where anything can be shared at any moment through social communication to a lot of right. people. Right. And so with the lack of friction there, you know, sometimes people are sharing things maybe when they're in it, in the weeds, in that sludge. And there's not a right or wrong by any means. There's no formula for this. It's not pass or fail. But one of the things that I've learned, especially having gone through some pretty intense times last year with my son Lincoln, is that it does help to at least have a tiny bit of perspective usually before sharing. Maybe that's an hour. Maybe it's 10 minutes. Maybe it's a month. Maybe it's a year. Whatever that means for you. And then I heard a a phrase, it's share your scars, not your wounds, not your open wounds. And I was Mm -hmm. like, yeah, that's nice. I kind of get that, you know. What's your philosophy on that? So let's say you're going through something and you know there's a lesson here. You've got the lesson. Maybe it's with your husband like we were just talking about. And you're excited to share. When do you share? Is that like a after reflection? But you still want to be timely and real and and have that energy of the recency. So, yeah. What's your yeah. philosophy on that one? I, I like that. Share your scars and not your wounds because in, to a certain degree, you know what I mean? Although I do think there's something really powerful if you were willing to share your wound, like when it's still not, you know, completely healed. I know that one of the biggest things I've seen in the last few years on the internet was when Morgan Harper Nichols, she, she posted this thing about, you know, when you feel as though you don't know where to go and the mountains and valleys you've climbed, you know, you're not sure where they've gotten you. And she was heartbroken that night when she wrote that and people felt it. And that opened a whole world for her because she was willing to be utterly vulnerable because she was really scared and feeling lost. And I think that that threw other people a lifeline, but at the same time we have to protect other people in the same way where it's like, we're not feeling as though it's other people's job to save us and have a lot of empathy. I think everything comes back to radical empathy for ourselves and other people. And that's what every relationship Mm -hmm. needs. And so if you have empathy for yourself and other people, maybe you would share, but without this sort of, I need you to fix it, right? And then I think you can share at any point, as long as there's not this like expectation that it's somebody else's job, but you're just, you know, you're just sort of putting it out there to be to be honest and to share. For me personally, I think too much so I adapted to learn to take care of myself as a kid. I very much was like a, I was more like my parents' parent than they were able to parent me in some ways. Um, My mom did really parent me in some ways, but in other ways, emotionally, she just was, there was a lot going on for her, struggling with depression and my dad left. So he wasn't really able to parent me because he was kind of in his own anger and his own issues. And then he was really gone. So I kind of at a fault take care of myself and then talk to people about what I went through. But I I, I try to 
tell myself to do more of the here's what's going on with me and I don't have it all figured out. And when I do that, I think people are, it's amazing. When, when I tell people like I'm struggling right now, I feel super anxious or I'm worried right now because I don't think my marriage is where it should, you know, I want it to be. People go, oh my God, that's so strong of you. Like what's so strong? I'm just telling you, you know, I think that we're all welcome here. And I think we forget because everyone's feeling broken. You know, we, we all have a range of feelings every day. There's no one who's having the perfect lunch, the perfect bathing suit, the perfect vacation. No one's having sex every day. No one, there's just no, none of that. And, and you're not alone if you're feeling like you're struggling. So I think it is important to, for us all to lean in more to the vulnerability because there's other people who will feel that you, you help them so much just because they don't feel alone, just because you reflected what they're feeling too. Like that's mm-hmm. huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, I'd say the systemic kind of, well, the genesis of vulnerability too is, is truth and, and, and being real. So you can't fake vulnerability. Let's just, I guess, put it that way. And so when it was really put on the map with Brene Brown, thank yeah. goodness, and, and just what she's been able to do to help people learn and, and educate them, all us, I'm a student, has been so positive. And I think sometimes people try to manipulate vulnerability where it, there's just, it's absolutely impossible. You know what I mean? So, but like you said, I, I love how, what you just said, you know, we're all welcome here. And so that to me, what an inclusive statement of however you're feeling, because if, if there is, you know, that feeling of, oh, I need, I need to try and you're, you're needing attention per se, then, then you do need people. You, you are welcome here yeah. and you will yeah. get it. Right. So it's, I don't know, it's deep thoughts on the, on the vulnerability front. Who yeah, knew? I agree. Yep. I'm, no, I'm glad you brought it up. I think it's really important. I think we, we we're seeing, you know, more depression and suicide because people mm-hmm. feel like they have to not be broken in order to be loved. And what I learned recently, I was reading Donald Miller's new book, Scary Close. Mm-hmm. It's not that new, but it's kind of new. And he was saying in there that if it's really love that you're being given, you're being given it. Love is not something you can earn. So if you think it's love, but you had to earn it, that's not love. That's something else. So love is only something that is given to you. And so mm-hmm. how sad if, no, if we don't give ourselves the opportunity to just be loved without having to earn it and be the person someone wants us to be or please someone or fill in the blank and do this thing or be helpful or useful or, uh, you know, whatever it is. And what's amazing is that everybody can do that today. Everybody could, you know, if you're waiting in line at Starbucks and you have five extra minutes, could you just love someone, text someone, offer them to grab something from them at Trader Joe's? Like, could you just show someone love, not because they earned it, not because they, just Mm -hmm. because you want to give that away mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and then ask somebody like, you know, what could be the most powerful three minutes of, of anyone's life is you asking someone what's up for you right now and not having any advice and not responding, just saying, I'm just going to listen for three minutes and really listen. And then I'm not going to say anything and I won't ever bring it up again. Mm-hmm. Like if everyone mm-hmm. gave that to someone once a week for three minutes and said, I'm not going to give you advice. I don't have anything prepared to say, I'll never bring it up again. Just tell me for three minutes what's really going on with you right now. Mm. We literally changed the world. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. And it's, you're, you're kind of feeding the machine too, because it's serotonin and it, that comes back to you. It's the most selfless, selfish thing you can do <laughs> is Ooh, to I love that. listen and, and it doesn't take much you know it's my uh, my very best friend and I we exchange voice notes all the time and she's not on social at all so I can't keep up with her day-to-day play-by-play but she can keep up with mine and she tells me about an old tv show I think it's Felicity which I never Mm -hmm. actually watched but she tells me about it and how they would (laughs) Felicity and her friend I guess would exchange cassette tapes um, and they would That's give so like notes or like they're, they'd record messages to each other, oh kind of like a, a love Boxer. letter or a friend letter, yeah. love or yeah. letter. Anyway, so we do that. And sometimes they're like eight minutes long and nine minutes long. And, 
We never expect an immediate response. They're not meant for anyone else. Oftentimes, it's just updating, sharing our deep thoughts. But there's something about expressing and knowing the recipient is receiving it with 100% zero judgment <laughs> in their, you know, intentions at all. And it's, and then there really isn't more to it than that, but it's amazing how good it feels. And then to hear it and receive exactly. it and feel that. Um, so anyway, I encourage, if you're feeling disconnected with a friend and you're listening to this, um, try that, you know, and uh, have zero expectations around it. It's not about getting back to the person right away, but it's amazing how it can make you feel more connected. And it's on your own time when you have time. So anyway, I'm a big voice note fan. I am too. And there's so many cool apps now. I'm I'm not sponsored by them, but Marco Polo is free. Boxer is free. Yeah. I love using those. And I think that that's such an easy way to do what you just said. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's serotonin. You you get ahead of it, they get ahead of it, and if anybody else is in the vortex, they're gonna and is absorbing it, they will get ahead of it too. Exactly. So let's talk again, real quick, back on the subject matter of being in the business of helping people quit their day jobs. And do you feel like for some people they should just keep their hobby their hobby, and it it actually isn't something that makes sense to pursue. Um, because I hear it just like you do. I hear often, I'm not sure what my thing is. And usually mm-hmm. people's, their first tendency is to go to a hobby yeah, and then want to turn that into a side hustle and then want to turn that into a full-time job. Right. And I've done right. that in the past. I thought I was going to be a jewelry maker at one point. It's quite comical. No, you did it. Oh, yeah. Sass jewelry, Kathy. Sass jewelry was a oh, thing. I had business cards. God, I love that I had a, so I had a much. Flicker site like Flickr page. Oh yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Um, okay, so here's uh, what I would say about that, which is that people don't really understand the difference between a business and a hobby, and I'm going to tell you from my perspective what the difference is. So a hobby means I can do something that I like. I can do something for myself. I can do something that feels good to do. As soon as it's a business, by definition, the difference is that someone's paying me. There's a business involved which means somebody else wants or needs the thing I'm making. So in order for your music to become not a hobby, but a business, I have to make the music that somebody wants to spend money on. So for me, I had to go from just like singing on a subway platform and making $8 to thinking, wait, what would Pixar want? And what story are they telling? And how could I use my gift to make the thing that they want? And I'd have to then make something that they're willing to spend $70,000 on for a license use. And then I can make something else. And do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the answer is, if you want to be in business, then it's not, you have to ask a different question. Instead of saying, is this, is this hobby going to be a business? It's more like, what's the, what's the business in this hobby? Yes. Like if what I'm making is pottery, it's like, great, well, you can make all kinds of things, but what would be the thing that somebody wants? So it's about identifying first a place to start because the answer is you don't know yet so you say okay this is what i have this is my song this is the pottery i make this is the candle i make this is the 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 group retreat i want to start okay you begin and then you ask yourself who would this be for who would want this retreat who would buy this candle who would eat this vegan cupcake whatever it is find one person for free and sit her down and say do you like this vegan cupcake i thought of you yeah i'm vegan you're you're right well what don't you like about it well, what would you pay for it in the past when you've ever gone to buy a vegan cupcake what did you like or not like about what you found and then continue to try to make the thing that that person wants and then if they buy it now you know it's a business so what most people do is they don't validate anything they don't build a business they build a hobby and then they try to make it a business and it doesn't work So I see people spending hours and months building an app, hours and months creating a a coffee shop, hours and months and years building fill in the blank. And then they try to convince somebody to want it. But what we have to do is we have to begin with who wants it. And we have to really get as close to that person as possible and just make them make, make it to order. Right. Right. Make to order. What do you want? Oh, great. It's much easier to make your friend a birthday party (laughs) or a dinner. If you just ask her what she likes to eat, then go into the grocery store and be like, oh, today I I decided I'm going to make cheese and dip and fondue. And it's like, oh, she does. She's lactose intolerant. Well, that didn't work. I should have started with who is she? Oh, she loves sushi. I'm going to hit it out of the park. I'm going to do hand rolled sushi. I'm going to hire a sushi chef and be the best 40th birthday party she ever had. Boy, will she felt people need to feel seen. And if it's a business, 
it's what I said before, radical empathy. A business is only one thing, which is scaling intimacy. So if you're able to have somebody pay you for something, you figured out a thing that someone wanted. And the more somebody pays you, it's because you you made more of what they wanted. It's, it's at a higher value. It's giving them more of the thing they need. It's saving them more time. It's giving them more of that thing that they couldn't find. It's really solving their problems. It's really... And, it's and so my question for you, though, and I, I hear you 100%. And I love what you said, too, by the way. Business is just scaling intimacy. That's got to double down on that one. So my question for you is, if your experience with your hobby and your relationship with your hobby is such that you feel relaxed and leisure while you're doing it, and it is amazing because there's zero pressure, and that's a big part of what you love about your hobby – that may not be the right thing to then try and turn into Correct. a business because Correct. if if it just happens to be there's a golf club in your hand, but really you just love being outside clearing your head and it really doesn't exactly. matter, doesn't exactly. mean you want to learn exactly. to, you know, whatever exactly. golf ball business. I don't know. Yeah, because oh, it, might analogy, wind up, it, <laughs> it might wind up taking away from yeah, you. That's yeah. your meditation. You know, right, sitting right. doing crocheting is your release. However... I do contend that since most people are going to spend the majority of their time at work and then the, the second biggest time is sleeping, you may as well find something you like to do that you feel brings you a sense of purpose during the hours that you're working. And so therefore, is there some version, is there some derivative of the thing you love that you could make into a business that you wouldn't mind caring about what the person wants? Because then you could be doing that and scaling that. And spending all of your energy on that because I feel that the only reason I've been able to make multi seven figures with music and with everything else is because the juice was there. When the juice is there and you got the word, the big word, enthusiasm around the thing, that's when you can make more money than in anything else. Because if you're just doing something you don't have enthusiasm around, you're going to work harder, not smarter, and you're going to actually not make as much money. So we do need to find the thing that brings us enthusiasm, and it might take. Yep. It might take trying a few things until we figure out what that is, where our enthusiasm meets something that somebody wants. But will it be, will it be worth it? Yeah, because the time, God willing, will pass anyway. You may as well just start to take a few steps in the direction of your joy and start to have some prototypes. And maybe your music leads you to a podcast. Maybe your music leads you to making colorful pens. Who knows? My friend Amy Tangerine started out making t-shirts and now she does hand lettering and scrapbooking. So it's worth it. And we're, we're pivoting all the time anyway. Like people say, what, where are you going to be in three years, five years? I'm like, I don't know. I wake up every day and I'm like, what, what's the gut check right now? Where's my upper limit right now? Where can I be of, of use right now? And where we can be of use, we can sometimes throw our enthusiasm into and find the way that we can show up and, and stand out. 100%. And it is. It's worth that discovery process. It's not always the obvious default of, oh, I'm. this makes sense. You ha- You do. You have to date things. You have to date ideas. And and um, and you usually will end up being a marketer <laughs> in addition to whatever it is that thing that you're doing. Right. So you can just add marketer to yourself. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so the, and just to kind of close this loop too, one of the things that – you know, I'm so excited for people to hear from you is, is your enthusiasm. Like you, again, you can't fake that. So having a true, honest check with yourself of what lights me up, it's, it's an inside job. We hear that all the time, but it truly is. And no one else outside can tell you. And we do, we hear all that feedback from our loved ones, our friends, they want us to be happy. So they think they know how to guide us. And, um, and sometimes you do have to turn those noise cancelers on and just you go oh, into yeah. your, your little cave and you bring yeah. out your project when it's ready. But protect yep. it. Protect yeah. that, that idea. I think that the thing that I see most in what you were just saying is that I think everybody has Michael Jordan level talent at something. And I think that the problem is there's no momentum. It's not that you lack the talent. There's no momentum because you're just not taking action. And you're not taking action because you're overthinking it, which goes back to the 20 seconds of courage and just doing something messy Mm -hmm. because all the momentum, all the clarity around what this is, all the confidence is in the doing. You don't start out with any confidence or any clarity. So when I look at people like you, Amy, or I look at people like 
all the people you've had on your show, all the people that have been on my show, Mark Cuban, everybody, everybody. I see tremendous courage because I know that you and me and everybody that we know and everyone we look up to, if you're successful in anything, even in your marriage, whatever it is, it's because you had the courage to say, I don't know. I don't know for sure that I'm the right one for the job. I don't know for sure that this will work, but I'm willing to be vulnerable and I'm willing to put myself out there. And I think that that is so worthy of then being recognized. Fortune favors the brave. I think of every movie I've ever seen, whether it's Rocky or Moana, like any movie (laughs) is about a person who's going through that hero's journey of feeling like they come up against their upper limit, all the voices in their head that tell them you can't do it, you won't do it, you're going to fail. And then they get tested and they get tested again. They get knocked down, they get back up. And we love those movies. We love Rudy. We love all those movies because we relate because there's a quality inside of us that we want to be, we want to be braver. We want to do those things and we root for that person. So we have to do that more in our own life. Very true. Absolutely. And it's those moments taking advantage of those moments of bravery, literally seconds. Okay. So final question for you, what commitment can you make to yourself right now to better your future? Me personally? Yes. Well, after the conversation I had with my husband last night, I think that I need to, even though I think he's wrong, (laughs) he wants that when I ask him for help that I do it in a nicer way. And I think I'm very nice, but I think that I have to learn to be even softer with him because everything else in my life right now is kind of rocking and rolling. And I find that we, and, and, and the truth is we've, we've been in the best season that we've ever been in coming off of like one of our worst seasons. So things have been really, thank God, good. But I think that, that I'm hitting a snag because he feels he's going through this period of like, okay, she's the one, you know, doing all the stuff and bringing in all this money. And now she's asking for the help. And I kind of go, what's the big deal? And I think I have to do it. And I think if I can do it in a softer way, it'll wind up being a big reward for me. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to do that. Even though I think I'm already being nice, I have to be even, you know, try, try to do it better. Ooh. He's going to love to hear this. You have to share this with him. That's really that's well, a big, hey, that's a biggie. <laughs> well, and it, it won't be as fresh, I imagine, when he hears it. Sure. But yeah, no, that's it's a big one. It's sometimes life is like, like whack-a-mole, right? Where certain things, you've got them and they figure right? it out. And then there's going to yeah. something in another department of life is just going to pop up. And that's awesome to hear. That's a lot of personal growth on both of your ends to be able okay. to even navigate that situation, believe me. Oh, right it's now. all the things all the time. I heard Amy Porterfield saying that. I, I don't know if she said that when she was on my show or some that like there are moments where her business is soaring and then her marriage is in another place and it's hard to get it all right all the time. Oh, yeah. uh, but there are moments. There are moments when you're like, Wee! You're like oh, <laughs> oh darn it. Enjoy this. Because <laughs> yeah, it will exactly. pass. Exactly. Yes. Uh, it's it's seasons, right? Well, thank you, Kathy. This is this has Thank been fun you. to catch up. I can't wait to have you back on my show. So you guys stay tuned for that. She's going to be back. Oh, yeah. Can't wait. Nothing is off limits when we chat. So okay, I appreciate good. that. <laughs> All right. And take care. We'll be following along your journey. And, um, yeah, thank you for the important work that you're doing. It uh, is making an impact, a huge impact. Right back at you, sister. <laughs> everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. Hit me up on social media to let me know what you think. I'm at Amy Jo Martin on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And I want to hear your why not now moments so I can share them on the show. Just send me a note to why not now at amyjomartin.com. For show notes and other offers, you can visit amyjomartin.com forward slash why not now. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email newsletter for exclusive content and announcements. A big thanks to Rock Salt Music for all of the tunes by the talented John Coggins. And of course, a hat tip to Richard Gruer for editing and producing the show. I'll see you next time. And until then, why not now? Oh, 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 o